So I didn't realize until pretty recently that some people actually watched these videos or still watch them. Um, so I was just going to go over a few things that I've done over the past few years that I haven't gotten to talk about much. Um, the first one is publication. So I did actually discover a new species. Um, it is not a new species of seahorse. I wish it were a new species of seahorse. That'd be awesome. It is not. It's actually um, a parasite that lives in the gut of a worm called a peanut worm. So it's this parasitic flatworm that lives in another worm. And the host worm is called a cypunculin. I think they're super cool um, and weird. They actually secrete acid from their skin that they can use to melt down rocks and then will bore into rocks using those secretions. So a uh, little bit of a story of how I discovered this species. I was actually helping the professor, Dr. Julie Bailey Brock, who I used to work for on a class field trip. And I was looking for some of these worms. Um, I was doing a project on these cypunculin worms. And we collected a few on this field trip. One of the ways that you figure out what the species is or kind of confirm the species of cypunculin is to cut them open. And then you fold out this, a piece of skin from the inside of the body wall and count how many muscle bands there are. So I was like counting muscle bands in worm skin. I noticed that there was like stuff swimming around the gut and I was like, oh, what is this? It's a little bit weird. Um, it turned out that it was this parasitic flatworm and I had no idea what they were. Um, the whole process of figuring out it was a new species was really hard, really challenging, but I loved it. Um, I love kind of these obsessive projects where like every day I got to come into work and be like, what is it? How do I prove what it is? So the first thing you have to do um, is do a literature, literature search to figure out what the animal is and if anyone has ever found it before. So I used a taxonomy key, so I tried to look up, it's like, based on what I know, it's like, okay, this is a flatworm, um, let's look at parasitic flatworms, and then go from there and see if I could get close to figuring out what the species was. I did eventually find out that it belongs to a genus called Colostoma, and there were all of these papers from years ago, somewhere from like the 70s, um, I think the most recent paper I found was maybe from the 70s or 80s, um, some of these papers were from the 40s, and so I had all of these different manuscripts from people who had described a uh, species of colostoma before and basically gave a checklist of how to figure out if it was one of the known species, which is called a taxonomy key. So I went through this checklist, and the animal I had didn't match those. So it got a little bit harder after that because I had to figure out how to look at this tiny microscopic animal, like as like 0.2 millimeters long, it is super tiny, um, and figure out like what traits it had, where the organs were, stuff like that. And I got um, help from a woman named Dr. Greta Abbey, or Dr. Greta Abbey. Um, she helped me with um, different techniques for how you look at live animals. And one of the things you have to do is relax certain specimens to look at them under a microscope without them moving around. I looked sort of insane because I had, um, you take a metal spoon and you put like seawater in it and you put like the little animal inside like this tiny worm and then you take a lighter and you really quickly run it underneath the spoon to heat it up. You don't want to cook it but you want to warm it up and relax the muscles. It looked kind of like I was doing worm crack at the lab that I worked in because I'm like just sit, like sitting there with like holding my spoon with the lighter like going underneath it trying to figure out how to relax it and like not cook them. Long story short, I may have like cooked and exploded a ton of worms. Um, at one point I had all these like syringes at my lab station too because I was trying to see if I could like inject dye into them. You cannot. You just explode the whole thing. But I tried. Um, I also had to come up with different staining agents to like stain the body tissues and that involved um, this one compound uh, it was borax carmine and you actually get it from powdered beetles and I had to synthesize the staining agent using like the borax carmine and I was like in, in an organic chemistry lab like heating stuff up and mixing like powdered beetles with different chemicals and trying to make the, this bright purple liquid so I could make worms pretty colors. Um, it felt kind of like Sad Potions class in Harry Potter. Um, it was awesome though. Uh, really frustrating but kind of awesome. So um, after all of that and after I stained the animal I got to do some sketches of it and it, these are like different sketches that were in series and 
you sketch it out and you like draw out different organs and ink it um, where the organs are and how different body parts connect to each other, these are some of them, um, really matter. And they matter a lot to distinguishing an animal as a species. Um, this kind of worm is a parasitic hermaphrodite, so it, is both ma it has both male and female reproductive organs at the same time. And figuring out where those are in relation to each other is super important. So I had to draw all these weird worm reproductive organs. So I have like many, many pages of worm reproductive organs. Um, after I did all of that, after I figured out like it was a new species, I really doubted it. I was just like, eh, no, there's no way I like found this and found a new species. But it turns out I did. Um, and then I got to write it up and I submitted it, my write up to the Journal of Natural History. And Dr. Wagner Magayas and Dr. Julie Bailey Brock were amazing mentors and helped me out a ton through the publication process. Um, getting your paper peer reviewed by specialists is really, really challenging. Um, it's kind of hard to like get some of your work back and have people who don't know you just like rip you a new one sometimes. Um, some of my critiques were things like, it was a British journal and I spelled color without a U, which was a huge faux pas. I also said that one of the worms was white and I'm not allowed to say that. Apparently I can only say it is whitish or albescent. So there were some of these like kind of rough critiques about my methodology, but it was good. Um, you know, when I first got it back and read them, I had a kind of emotional reaction, and then I went back through and reread it like eight times, like went through all my critiques, and they were all valid. Um, some of them I did have to justify and explain why I did things the way I did, and then I submitted my paper back with the corrections, and it was eventually published in the Journal of Natural History, so I can now find it on Google Scholar. And that was kind of how the publication process went for me. From start to finish, it took like maybe two or three months to actually do all the work and like write everything up and then after that it took um, close to like nine months for it to actually be published and be in the journal but that was more for um there were some like submission errors and like technical problems that happened not that the journal was slow um yeah it was overall it was one of the coolest experiences i've had i'm getting to say that i found a new species and i did name that new species after my one of my favorite authors, um, Hans Christian Andersen. So the name, the name of the worm is called Colostoma andersoni. Um, but yeah, that is a little bit about publication. And if you guys have any questions about the process or specifics, I would love to answer.